Stagecoach Mary, written by Jennifer Johnson and illustrated by Leslie McCleary. Born a slave somewhere in Tennessee, Mary lived to become one of the freest souls ever to draw breath, or a 38. Gary Cooper, American movie star. Table of Contents. A brief introduction. Mary Fields may have been born a slave, but she chose to rise above any limits society put on her. Before Martin Luther King Jr. ever said, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Mary forced people to reckon with the content of her character, and she came out on top. She is known for being America's first African-American female star route mail carrier for the United States Post Office. She was so much more than that. She wasn't afraid of anything or anyone, but she had a heart as big as the Montana sky. She made history. Tennessee. Mary Fields was born a slave in Hickman County, Tennessee. Because no one recorded the births of slaves, we don't know precisely when she was born, but it was in either 1830, 1832, or 1833. We don't know a lot about her early life. In fact, we know virtually nothing. There was, however, a great deal of conjecture. It is possible that her mother was a house slave and her father was a field slave. It is very possible that she was a slave for the Warner family. However, the Warners lived in West Virginia. There is so much we just don't know. An article printed in 1914 in the Great Falls Tribune stated, she was a slave in her youth, and because of that fact, she was brought up to know more about a man's work than those with which women are generally familiar. Although she did learn to read and write at some time, she left no written records of her life, so her early life will always remain a mystery. The Civil War. The Civil War started in 1861 and raged on for four divisive and bloody years. In the middle of the Civil War, in January of 1863, President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. By 1865, the Civil War had ended. Did Mary take advantage of her newfound freedom in 1863, or did she wait until 1865? We simply do not know. What was the Emancipation Proclamation? It was a document issued by President Abraham Lincoln that declared that all people held as slaves were now free. As you can see from the map, the Mississippi River runs along the western edge of Tennessee, and this is where Mary went looking for work once she was free. She eventually found work as a chambermaid on one of the many steamboats that traveled up and down the river. Some say she actually worked on the famous Robert E. Lee steamboat. A quick side note, the Robert E. Lee was one of the most famous steamboats of all time. It was massive at 285 feet long. The dining hall was big enough that 240 people could all eat dinner at the same time. In the summer of 1870, the Robert E. Lee and another steamboat named the Natchez raced from New Orleans, Louisiana to St. Louis, Missouri. That's a distance of 1,154 miles. The Robert E. Lee beat the Natchez with a time of three days, 18 hours, and 14 minutes. Some folks like to say that Mary was aboard the Robert E. Lee during that historic race, but there's no actual proof of this. Moving to Toledo. What prompted Mary to move to Toledo, Ohio? There are a few theories, none of them substantiated. One theory states that Mary met Judge Edmund Dunn aboard the steamboat where she worked. He was so impressed with her work ethic that he hired her to work in his home. Shortly after beginning this job, Judge Dunn's wife, Josephine, passed away, and the judge asked Mary to take his five children to his sister, Mother Mary Amadeus Dunn, in Toledo. 
It's a nice story, but probably didn't happen, as Josephine didn't die until 1883, and Mary arrived in Toledo 13 years before that, in 1870. A second theory revolves around the Warner family. It is possible that sometime before the Emancipation Proclamation, Mary was owned by the Warner family. Josephine Warner married Judge Dunn, and through this marriage, Mary would have met Judge Dunn's sister, Sarah Therese Dunn. When Sarah Therese moved to Toledo, she changed her name to Mother Mary Amadeus Dunn. Mary Field soon followed her to Toledo. When Mary arrived, Mother Mary Amadeus helped her get settled in and asked if she needed anything. Mary replied, yes, a good cigar and a drink. What really happened? Like a great deal of Mary's early life, we simply do not know. But what we do know is that Mary lived in Toledo, Ohio from 1870 to 1884. Ursuline Convent of the Sacred Heart. Mary spent the next 14 years of her life at the Ursuline Convent of the Sacred Heart. She and Mother Mary Amadeus actually became very good friends, despite Mary's sometimes prickly personality and the fact that she liked to smoke cigars, drink whiskey, and swear. During her entire life, Mary was a hard worker. While she was at the Ursuline Convent, she washed the laundry, bought supplies, ran the kitchen, and kept the yard and gardens in perfect condition. One nun is quoted as having said, God help anyone who walked on the lawn after Mary cut it. A quick side note. It wasn't until 1870 that the first human-powered lawnmower was built. So how did Mary keep the huge lawn of the Ursuline Convent cut? With a scythe. It was a super labor-intensive job. Mary would have held the handle with both hands and swung the scythe back and forth very quickly to cut the grass. It would have taken a supremely long time, and it may explain why Mary didn't want anyone walking on her freshly cut lawn. Moving to Montana. In 1884, the bishop sent Mother Mary Amadeus to Cascade, Montana, to work with the Jesuits at St. Peter's Mission. Her job was to open a school for the Blackfoot Indian girls. St. Peter's Mission was an orphanage home to many children. Within the year, Mary Fields followed her out west. Like many other things in Mary's life, the reasons why she followed Mother Mary Amadeus West are unclear. Again, we have two theories. One theory, is that Mother Mary Amadeus became very sick with pneumonia. Once Mary Fields heard this news, she packed up her belongings and headed west immediately. The other theory is that Mother Mary Amadeus wrote a letter to the nuns at the Ursuline Convent requesting help at the boarding school. Mary Fields joined the group of nuns who went west to help Mother Mary Amadeus. Either way, in 1884, Mary arrived in Cascade, Montana, where she would spend the rest of her life. The struggle to build a life in the West. Mary was one of the first and the only black Americans in Cascade, Montana. While the nuns loved Mary, it took a while for the townsfolk and the Jesuits who ran St. Peter's mission to accept her. In fact, one schoolgirl wrote of her, she drinks whiskey and she swears and she is a Republican, which makes her a low, foul creature. Mary had a temper as well. However, she was a very valuable employee. She did the laundry, worked the vegetable garden, raised the chickens, tended the grounds, and helped with the children. While the Jesuit priests felt that she was a bad example for the children due to her swearing and drinking and cigar smoking ways, she was very much needed to help run St. Peter's mission. One of Mary's main jobs was to drive the wagon the 15 miles into Cascade to buy supplies. This was by no means an easy trip. There were no paved roads at the time, and winter made the trip even more difficult. There is a story that one time she got caught in a blizzard, and it was so bad that she had to stop traveling. She was forced to walk back and forth all night long to keep from freezing. Another story 
tells of a time when a pack of wolves scared the horses and the wagon overturned. Mary had to guard the cargo all night long to keep the wolves out of it. In the morning, as the wolves retreated back into the woods, Mary put the wagon upright, reloaded the supplies, and traveled on down the road to the mission. In 2020, cowboy Eddie Lemire recalled Mary from when he was a child living at the orphanage. He said, they say she cussed like a sailor, but she didn't do it around the kids, or at least I never heard her. She loved to scare us, tease us really, but she was just playing. The little ones were told she would eat you if you're bad, and sometimes she made us believers. She was big. She smoked cigars, she dressed like a man, and she was as black as a stovepipe. There is no doubt that the nuns and the children of St. Peter's loved her. However, Bishop John Brondell, who was in charge of St. Peter's, certainly did not care for her brash ways. One day, she and a janitor got into an argument. Both the janitor and Mary drew guns on each other. Some accounts say that no shots were fired. Some accounts say that Mary fired and the janitor was hit in the buttocks by a ricocheting bullet. What really happened? Like much of Mary's life, we are not sure. What we do know is that Bishop Brondell was not happy and he fired her. At the age of 60, Mary was forced to find a new way to make an income. With Mother Mary Amadeus' help, Mary opened a restaurant. It, however, failed. Mary had a soft heart and wouldn't turn away anyone who was hungry, even if they couldn't afford to pay. She later tried to open a second restaurant, but it failed as well. It was in 1895 that Mary would put herself into the record books. She was 61 years old. The Star Route. It is very likely that Mother Mary Amadeus Dunn helped Mary get the United States Postal Service job. Some sources claim that Mother Mary put in a good word for her, and other sources assert that Mother Mary Amadeus purchased the horse and coach needed for Mary to do the job. Either way, in 1895, Mary proved that she was the lady for the job. Each applicant for the job had to show that they could hitch a team of six horses to a stagecoach. Mary not only hitched the horses, she also did it faster than any of the men applying for the job. Mary had become a Star Route mail carrier. Mary was the first African American, and only the second woman, to be a Star Route mail carrier, and she set the bar high for every mail carrier who has come after her. A quick side note, what exactly is a Star Route Carrier? A Star Route Carrier was an independent contractor for the United States Postal Service. This meant that they had to bid for specific routes and that they were paid for the completed route. People who applied to be Star Route Carriers had to meet the standards of celerity, certainty, and security. Celerity? What in the world does that mean? It's not a word we use much anymore, but when we did use it, it meant a swiftness of movement. That meant that star route carriers had to move quickly and with purpose. Mary would pick up the mail from the train in Cascade and then deliver it to all of the places on her route, including St. Peter's Mission. She covered more than 300 miles every week. The Postal Service motto was, Neither snow, nor rain, nor heat, nor gloom of night stays these couriers from their swift completion of their appointed rounds. Mary not only delivered the mail in all kinds of weather, she also never missed a day of work. Mary had become Stagecoach Mary. A quick side note from Cowboy Eddie Lemire. According to Eddie, they called her Stagecoach Mary because she used a stagecoach to deliver mail. She brought supplies from the train in Cascade and delivered them to the mission. She always made it, no matter what the weather was like. One Christmas, we had a blizzard and she was late. The nuns were expecting her. The road was drifting in and we were all worried. After supper and long after dark, we heard her shouting outside. She made it. 
She had gotten stuck in a snowdrift and had to abandon the stagecoach. She put the mail in her backpack and snowshoed the rest of the way to the mission. She brought us peanuts for all the kids. We got a big bag of peanuts for Christmas. It wasn't much, but it was the best peanuts I ever had. Peanuts don't taste like that anymore. There were several times when Mary's mule, Moses, couldn't get across the snowdrifts. It snows a lot in Montana. And Mary would have to simply put on snowshoes and sling the mailbag over her back. Mary delivered the mail for eight years. Then, at around 70 years old, she decided that it was time to retire. Retirement, sort of. But Mary didn't really retire. As a single woman, she still needed to find a way to make money. She opened a laundry business in her home. She also babysat for local children. In fact, one report states that she spent quite a bit of the money she earned babysitting buying candy for the children. One may think that she had mellowed out in her old age, but that really wasn't the case either. In the late 1800s, women weren't allowed to drink in the saloons. However, the mayor of Cascade decreed that she was the only woman allowed to drink in the saloons in Cascade. One time, while enjoying a drink, a man accused her of doing a poor job cleaning his shirts. She knocked him out with one punch. Rumor has it that there were no hard feelings. Mary also loved baseball. She loved it so much that she actually became the mascot for the Cascade baseball team. She could be found at the games hollering insults at the other team and the umpire on a regular basis. According to the Anaconda Standard, Mary belongs in that category of fans that believe an umpire who presumes to make a decision against the home team is a fit subject for the gallows or some other dire fate like that. She would even essay the task of licking the umpire herself if she thought that would help bring victory to the home boys. Mary is some fan, and all the baseball contingent of Cascade will swear to that. Another thing for which Mary had a great passion was gardening. According to a newspaper article, she was fond of picking bouquets of flowers from her garden and giving them to her neighbors. In 1913, the entire town of Cascade came out to celebrate her birthday. The article to the right ran in the Anaconda Standard on April 7, 1913. According to the article, Mary was a historic figure and a landmark. The article also states, There was a time when Mary's friends claimed if a fly lighted on the ear of one of the leaders of her four, she could use her choice of either shooting it off or picking it off with her whip end, and that if she was of a mind, too, she could break the fly's hind leg with her whiplash and then shoot its eye out with revolver. This accuracy with whip and shooting iron, however, is not a matter of Mary's boast. She always was modest about her claims as to either line, but it is a well-known fact that she had ability in both. On the occasion of her birthday, Ribbon badges that bore the words Mary Fields, 1830 to 1913, birthday, anniversary, March 15th, were printed and handed out to everyone. This article also states that she had given up her love of whiskey and taken to drinking milk. The Final Days On December 1st, 1914, the Great Falls Tribune ran the article Mary Fields Near Death. It seems that Mary's health had been declining for a few weeks, and the mayor and his wife wanted to make her last days as comfortable as possible. To that end, they took Mary to the hospital where she could receive constant care. Mary passed away on December 5, 1914, from liver failure. Train 237 brought her body from the hospital back to Cascade. Services were held at 3.30 in the afternoon, and there were so many flowers that attendees couldn't even see the casket. According to the Great Falls Tribune, the funeral was one of the largest ever held in Cascade. This is the life of stagecoach Mary Fields in timeline form.
flabbergasting facts. Because Mary didn't know for sure when she was born, she celebrated her birthday on March 15th. She had a standing $5 bet that she could knock a man out with one punch. She never lost that bet. According to a Toledo Blade article, she hid a revolver underneath her apron. In Cascade, she was the only woman the mayor allowed inside saloons. Most people write about movie stars, but in 1959, Gary Cooper, an American movie star who had met Mary as a child, actually wrote a magazine article about her. Mary's favorite flower was the pansy. Her funeral was held in an opera house. In 1912, her home burned to the ground. The people of Cascade chipped in to build her a new one. She would give bouquets of flowers to members of the baseball team who hit home runs. When the Cascade Hotel was sold, one of the conditions of the sale was that Mary be given free meals whenever she liked. She was the only black person to live in Cascade until 1959. This is a map of Mary's travels throughout her life. Below, you can see in chronological order where Mary traveled. With the red diamond, you can see that she was born in Hickman County, Tennessee. The green circle is in West Virginia. Did she spend time with the Warner family in West Virginia? Quite possibly. The blue banner is from when she worked on steamboats on the Mississippi River. The purple home is Ursuline Convent in Toledo, Ohio. And then the brown mark is Cascade, Montana. This is the bibliography where I got all of the information for writing this book, as well as the pictures that I used. Index. All of the definitions come from https colon backslash backslash kids.wordsmith.net. This is an index of all of the words that I thought might be a little unfamiliar. Jen's Jots. I had never heard of Stagecoach Mary Fields until the first time I played the board game Western Legends. By chance, the character I chose to play was Mary. I wasn't even sure if she was a real person or not. However, her description was intriguing and I couldn't help myself. I wanted to learn more. As I began to do research, I found that she was far more complex than I would have originally thought, yet more was unknown about her than was known. I hit a gold mine when I discovered that there were newspaper articles about her. The article, Cascade is Joyful on Mary's Birthday, provided me more information than any other source and was super fun to read. Yahoo for primary sources. The librarians at the Library of Congress were extremely helpful digging up that newspaper article for me. If you are curious about something or someone, do some research. It's far more rewarding when you can take your time and really explore a subject that you enjoy. Happy reading. Points to ponder. She had a heart as big as the Montana sky. What does that mean? Can you create a sentence comparing your heart or the heart of someone you know to something in nature? Mary lived to become one of the freest souls to draw breath, or a 38. How does Gary Cooper use creative language in this quote? How does his word choice create a picture of who Mary is without directly telling his audience? Why do you think we know so little about Mary's life? Mary had many limits that were placed on her by society. Do you feel like limits are placed on you? What are they? What options do you have to face those challenges? Describe three attributes that Mary displayed, kind, hardworking, determined, etc. Give an example of each. Despite the fact that Mary was the only black person living in Cascade, the townspeople seemed to love her and she them. What can be learned from this? Look at the picture from the cover of the book. Check out the icons surrounding Mary Fields. Can you match them to different events in Mary's life? The end.